Hey everybody, welcome to the Muscle Intelligence Podcast. If you can't hear it in my voice, I've been a little under the weather, so I apologize if we've missed a podcast this week, but have no fear, we are coming back full force this week, next week, and forever, and upgrading the podcast as best we can going forward. We're going to be doing some really cool stuff. Um, today's guest is the creator of the Prize Protocol. What is prize? P, protein pacing. R, resistance. I, interval. S, stretching. E, endurance. Dr. Paul Asiero joins me today to talk a little bit about his protocol that he believes will be the life-changing protocol for everyone looking to optimize their fitness. Um, Paul is a doctor who travels the world teaching about the necessity of protein. Uh, we talk a little bit about what protein pacing is and why you do, why you should do it, um, why someone who is healthy may need less protein than someone who is not. Um, he's got some really interesting research, some really interesting concepts we talk about. Uh, we talk a little bit about gluconeogenesis and what happens with excess protein. Um, we talk about endurance and cardiovascular exercise impact on brain health as Paul dives a little bit deeper into his prize pot- protocol. Um, we talk about gamifying exercise, which is a very interesting concept that I apply in my life and with my children, and just making it fun and um, building fitness into your life is a big thing that I think everyone needs to consider as you age. When you're young, it's really easy to stay fit and stay active. When you become busy, it becomes very easy to not. So I highly suggest uh, everyone learns to just build fitness into your life, you know, build the, the long walks in, build the games into your life so that fitness just becomes part of the daily grind. Um, the importance of charging your batteries and getting into a parasympathetic state is something we also discuss. And you guys know that that is probably my great, greatest conversation right now, or at least what most people are hearing from me is how necessary it is for you to dig into the parasympathetic nervous system when you really want to build muscle or when you really want to lose fat or when you really want your brain to work. It's not just about, hey, I need to put my foot on the gas pedal or, hey, I need to take more nootropics or, hey, I need to sleep. Uh, It's all these things that are parasympathetically oriented that are going to allow you to access those peak states. So if you're someone who's lacking the ability to focus, maybe you're lacking the ability to be creative, um, or be even be productive, uh, parasympathetic state is going to be massively important. We don't talk too much about that, but I've got some awesome documents coming out on muscleintelligence.com. Actually, you guys can go over to muscleintelligence.com right now. It's officially live. And go to muscleintelligence.com slash podcasts. And there's two free uh, PDFs there for you. So one of my 44 success principles And one of my 30-day habit calendar, which uh, you guys are going to love. So one habit for every day of the month. And I've got one on my fridge. And you can just go every day and take a look and uh, implement one habit that's going to make your life better this day and for the rest of your life. It's a really cool little tool we've created for you guys. Uh, Absolutely no charge. So uh, without further raspy rambling from me, I hope you guys enjoy my podcast with Dr. Paul Asiero. So I'd love to, for you to first tell us what protein pacing is and then follow that, up, follow that up with letting us know exactly how we break down prize. Sure. So you know, protein pacing literally has been out there for a long time. It just has never been termed that, right? So the work that Stu uh, Phillips has done at McMaster and some of these other uh, protein scientists um, – And I'm part of the International Protein Board. And I know you've had, I think, uh, my buddy, uh, Dr. Rob on. Yeah, he's awesome. Yeah, he is. He's he's a bright guy. So uh, we just met in Dallas a couple of weeks ago. But, you know, it's nice because, um, you know, we're all searching for the same answer. We're all trying to figure it out. And again, we have no dog in the fight. Um, It's just a matter of what we want to promote based on what the science says. And one of my favorite sayings is, um, you know, good quality science doesn't care what you believe. And I really like that because, you know, it removes your personal bias in something. And so what I have done is really picked up on what the other experts have uh, found and and Stu being one of the leaders and taken this concept of applying uh, not high protein, but the 
the appropriate amount of protein uh, throughout the course of the day to maximize our body's response. And again, we kind of bring it to the level of, of fractional protein synthesis, um, so muscle protein synthesis. But of course, protein has so many other roles inside the body, but that's one kind of proxy measure of what the amino acids are devoted to. And, and that's an important one, obviously, protein synthesis. So what I've done is I've said, all right, how can we apply this on more of a practical uh, human body level? And so I've just, over the years, uh, recruited various groups of people, and I've um, applied this this concept of, of protein pacing, which really is about um, providing an, a level of protein somewhere in the ballpark of 20 to 40 grams per serving, or the equivalent of 0.25 to 0.5 grams per kilogram of body weight. And if you do the numbers, it comes out to about 20 to 40 grams. Um, and depending upon the goals of the person, you would adjust it. So I've, I've developed some algorithms that help the application of it on the fly. So for example, if somebody is uh, morbidly obese, let's say, and they're trying to safeguard against loss of their healthy, metabolically active lean muscle mass, at the same time, induce a significant uh, caloric deficit so that they can lose weight, um, it's adjusted to help provide an optimal amount of protein to maintain that healthy lean skeletal muscle mass, or at least as much as possible maintain it. Because, you know, most of these uh, individuals that are going on weight loss diets, which are so common, you know, they're down at 1200 calories a day, sometimes even less than that. So uh, you have to adjust the protein to make sure that you're safeguarding against that uh, drop in, in lean body mass. Whereas if it was somebody who, for example, was um, active uh, in general, just you know, a general uh, fitness-minded man or woman who was not necessarily looking to lose weight or gain weight, but to kind of maintain their, their current muscle mass, they're pretty efficient at their body's ability to utilize uh, the protein and the amino acids uh, that are being delivered into the amino acid pool in the body and, and being taken up by the muscle to help support protein synthesis. They don't need as much, you know, and I think that's a, a big uh, misunderstanding of the general population that just because they're fitness minded and they're active uh, on a regular basis, they think they need to uh, comply with this much higher protein intake. And if they're not looking to build more muscle, they're not looking to lose any weight, but to kind of maintain that general healthy, active lifestyle, their body is super efficient at taking those amino acids and doing what they need. Do they still need the protein pace? Yes, but they don't need to be up at that 40, 50 gram per serving amount. They could be down at 20 to 25. Uh, for so many protein pacing uh, simplified is just basically the idea of eating 20 to 40 grams every few hours. Yeah, I, I try to um, gauge it on, on every three and a half to four four and a half hours. Um, so four hours to me is the, kind of the sweet spot. So every four hours you're feeding. And again, that's about the time that um, postprandial thermogenesis. So the fancy word for digestion that yep. occurs, you know, if you want to have uh, optimal digestion, it's going to take you three to four hours of that amount of protein. Has anyone started to quantify the reasoning behind, you know, obviously the health of the organism. So someone who's healthier and more athletic is going to have better protein synthesis, but the idea of, of these people who maybe are morbidly obese, um, I'm just basically what I'm getting at is, is there a difference in the rate of gluconeogenesis between the two? So if someone's having, is someone obese, um, are they going to have a greater rate of gluconeogenesis thereby maybe needing more amino acids or, or what's the, how do we quantify the difference is like, I just want to start to understand the mechanism why someone who is healthy is going to need less protein than someone who's not. Yeah, no, that's a really good question. So let's take, for example, let's start with the uh, the normal healthy individual, and then we can extrapolate to the individual that's obese and has um, much uh, less insulin sensitivity. In fact, they're actually insulin resistant. So in somebody that's got healthy insulin sensitivity, and they're looking to help maintain that lean muscle mass that they have, uh, their, their body is just better adapted. Um, and so when those amino acids are coming in and being distributed in the amino acid pool, uh, you know, they're, they're being taken up. And because of insulin, and, and again, that paper that just came out, um, I know Stu Phillips had, had put it on to social media, but it was showing that, you know, you don't need um, carbohydrate to help drive that uptake of, of amino acids of protein. You know, if you give a high quality protein source, it's going to get into the muscle, um, you know, regardless of whether or not you had a, you know, a carbohydrate delivery system. And again, that, that's that. an interesting, that's an interesting topic, right? You don't have to go on a tangent, but 
is that the same amongst everybody would be my first question, right? If someone's insulin resistant, maybe, you know, like, is that going to differentiate? So I'm curious, I'd like to see that study actually. Yeah, I can share that with you after we, we get done. It, it's a um, great study and, and it helps support the fact that, you know, when people who are healthy and normal uh, insulin sensitivity and, and their body doesn't need to uh, drive insulin up to help push things along, you know, that the cells are able to um, uptake and the liver is able to regulate a little bit better um, the amino acid uh, pool. You don't need to have that insulin. Um, so you're the, the level of, let's say, you know, if the blood sugar did get down and you need to have some uh, gluconeogenesis occurring, um, you know, you, you wouldn't have insulin getting in the way to help prevent that, right? Because that's something that would um, diametrically oppose uh, that from happening. If people have high insulin levels, um, that's going to make things a little bit harder. So in the obese individual, um, backing up in, in the normal person, insulin doesn't need to drive the uptake to any significant degree of the amino acids into the muscle to help promote uh, protein synthesis. So they're gonna better self-regulate um, protein synthesis, uh, amino acid uptake into the muscles. They don't need to necessarily over intake of amino acids to help um, allow protein synthesis to uh, occur. And the efficiency of what happens inside the muscle, the ability of the muscle to undergo protein synthesis um, is working so efficiently that, you know, there's not a lot of extra cellular processes that are going on or need to go on at the same time inside the cell. And so the, the, the data shows very strongly that in people that have uh, normal insulin, insulin sensitivity, they have normal uptake of amino acids and, and um, distribution, their, their body's ability to manufacture and to uh, undergo protein synthesis is, is very efficient. And therefore, they don't necessarily need. And interestingly enough, the, um, the, the total amount of amino acids that's required is, is, is not as high. And so I just think that we, we kind of missed the, the boat a little bit with just this general recommendation that if you're fitness minded and you're exercising, your protein requirement has to go up um, super high and the body's working pretty efficiently. So it doesn't necessarily have to. In the obese individual, because of insulin sensitivity, insulin is, is um, obviously not doing its job uh, as effectively um, as it can be. And so their cells are, I, you, you've probably heard this before, they're, they're starving in a sea of excess, right? And so, you know, when you think about the obese model, um, unfortunately, their, their muscle cells um, are starving despite having uh, an abundance of nutrients and energy that's circulating right outside of, of the cell. And so they just need to have things um, a little bit higher, at least at the beginning, to help support um, what needs to take place inside the cell. So for example, in the muscle cell, the requirement for them to have a slightly higher amino acid intake works for two reasons. One is it helps provide the amino acids that are necessary to help support protein synthesis. Um, number two, it's also providing a nutrient that will minimize the intake uh, to support their energy needs of something like carbohydrate. So by providing more protein, you're increasing metabolism, you're helping support protein synthesis, and you're not driving up the blood sugar as would happen if somebody um, was taking in more carbohydrate. I'm very still, I'm very curious about this concept of gluconeogenesis. So are you able to differentiate if, um, say, you or I, being healthy individuals, were to eat an excess of protein in one meal, say we eat 80 to 100 grams of protein in one meal, what would physiologically be happening to that excess of protein or, or within the system, comparing that against someone who you know, is obese and uh, would there be a difference? So first I'd like to know what's actually happening in a healthy person and then comparing that against someone who's obese. Well, in a healthy person, I mean, are you, are you, um, let me just make sure I'm clear before I answer 80 to hundred grams at one meal Yeah. or is it over yeah. the course of a day? No, at one meal, like I'm at consuming an excess e either in one meal or over the course of a day. Let's say, you know, one meal I have had a hundred, but over the day I'm going to be 500, right? So yeah. I'm clear, I'm clearly over and above what my body can use yeah. uh, at this particular time. Am I going to, am I going to drive gluconeogenesis? Am I going to convert it to protein? And is that different person to person? And, and do we have the science on that? Yeah, well, it's, um, I don't know if we have the science in that. I mean, I think there have been some studies that have uh, looked at, uh, for example, Jose Antonio, you know, did a recent study where he provided um, three 
in excess of three grams. Um, in fact, it might have even been close to four grams per kilogram of body weight. So, you know, in some of those eating occasions, they were probably up that high. So what would happen? Well, you're going to have obviously um, some futile uh, energy pathways that are kicking in. Um, the liver is obviously going to um, do its job that it would normally do in helping distribute um, amino acids to tissues that were in need of it. Muscles would clearly satisfy their their needs. And so what happens to that excess? Well, we know that thermogenically, so, so number one, if you're up at 80 to 100 grams in a normal healthy person, that extra amount um, is going to serve the needs that it has to in the other tissues. The liver is going to be the primary regulator of that, right? Brain's going to get some skeletal muscle, vital organs, and, and other areas, blood, are going to um, take what they need from that amount. But that excess, um, you know, that's when thermogenesis kicks in for a lot of people. And, you know, there's some evidence with these overfeeding studies that when you have that high of of a protein intake, because it's so thermogenically costly, um, I, I, there's, it's very likely that a portion of that excess of, of protein is going to be burned off. And we, we're going to account for that, you know, 25 to 30 percent increase in our uh, metabolic rate is going to go up uh, in, during postprandial thermogenesis. S some of it, yeah, I would imagine that. Um, some of the branch chain amino acid breakdown uh, is going to lend itself to some gluconeogenic precursors um, that would be delivered back to both the liver and maybe even the kidney would, would increase a little bit of its own production. We have some gluconeogenesis occurring there too. And then I think on that, the, the kidneys would probably have to work a little bit harder, you know, to break down some of that excess proteins. But again, so much of that depends upon the, the relative, obviously, the relative muscle mass of the person. So to answer your question, I think so much of it has to do with what's the, um, the skeletal muscle mass pool that the person has um, to help uh, utilize some of those amino acids, um, and then what the other needs of the, of the body are. But I think it's pretty safe to say that a normal, healthy individual, um, once it has met the needs of the skeletal muscle pool, once it's met the needs of the other vital tissues and organs, once the liver has kind of stored away and, and um, taken what it needs and has planned for what maybe some of the needs of the rest of the body are, I think that some of that is going to just go to um, kind of those futile cycles of, of uh, energy expenditure and, and normal digestion of that amount. Um, how much of that would be kicked back uh, into the production of gluconeogenesis? Um, I don't know. I mean, it's a, that's a really good question. But I think you'd have to take into all those other factors, the general uh, quantity of muscle mass. And, and right, then so the obese and the obese individual, you know, what would account for that? Again, it would depend on their skeletal muscle mass content. Um, and I think the, the, the same thing, uh, they, they're going to struggle a little bit more with, with um the metabolic cost, but I think they would also benefit from that, not benefit, I think some of the excess amino acid right. um, intake. Do you think the body would, would start slowing down stomach emptying in any way to kind of retain some of that uh, protein for, for the future? Because here's where I'm going with the question, Dr. Paul. Um, you know, a lot of people are talking about this, this whole macros concept, right? If you hit your macros for the day, you're good. Well, yeah. it doesn't sound like that's the case, right? It sounds like you know, if I'm just going to eat one big bolus of protein at one meal compared to eating six meals or five meals, it doesn't seem like the body has the capacity to retain this, you know, 120 grams of protein at one meal versus over four. It seems like it has to be a completely different physiological scenario in, in a body, right? So I'm just trying to kind of get at that is. Um, okay. Yeah. What we know is that when that uh, amount, that excess amount of amino acids presents itself in the body, there's a threshold. Um, and again, I'll point back to some of the work that uh, has come out of McMaster, that when we see that level of protein that kind of exceeds that, that threshold of that 20 to 40, some would maybe um, argue it can go as, as high as 50 grams per feeding, per occasion of eating, um, even protein synthesis is reduced. So, and I, I, I'm, what I'm basically saying is I don't know what the answer is, or I don't know what the other things are accounted for in that. Um, but we do know that uh, when you look at the work that's been done showing uh, these dose responses of protein ingestion, when it gets over 
30, uh, 40 to 50 grams, even then the body's ability to what you would expect to happen, increasing protein synthesis doesn't occur. In fact, we've actually seen a, a, a suppression of it. And so if you look back at that work out of um, McMaster, you know, when they gave those boluses of 10 versus 20 versus 40, the rates of, of uh, protein synthesis over that 12 hour period were the highest in the individuals that had taken in the 20 grams per serving. Those that took in the 40 grams, they actually had a reduction in their protein synthesis. So the question then is exactly what you're asking is, you know, what what's going on there? Is it being held on for um, later? I don't know. Um, maybe, you know, uh, there, there's something. Is, is metabolism, and in that study, metabolism wasn't uh, measured. You know, is it, again, just kind of what we call these feudal, you know, energy um, uh, pathways that are just burning and are people uh, increasing uh, metabolic cost of the digestion of those excess amino acids. Um, I don't know. Uh, the, I'm sure the liver is is accounting for some of that uptake for sure. And it's just a, um, has, has someone has anybody begun to uh, substantiate what actually happens? You know, so you brought up the idea of um, if we consume more protein, our body tends to become less. Um, likely to synthesize protein yeah that's sufficient so thereby is it is it you know logical to think that if we decrease protein intake over a period of time uh, it may actually require less protein to initiate the protein synthesis uh process wow so you know that that right there i think is the uh you know the million dollar question in nutrition does the body become more efficient when you limit the availability um and I don't think we have a good answer on that, but it makes some intuitive sense, right? I mean, so uh, let's just go to the other extreme. People that follow, for example, a ketogenic diet, right? You know, Atkins was kind of the the, the one who sensationalized it. Um, but since then, it's really caught on the ketogenic diet. So let's say you're following it at the level of, of strictness of 10% of carbohydrate. So what we do know, and we have some evidence for that when people... Um, kick out of that disciplined 10% carbohydrate intake, and they do ingest some additional carbohydrate, the body's um, biochemical pathways in uh, utilizing and storing that carbohydrate uh, goes up exponentially. You know, they just become hypersensitized, um, you know, whether it's a change in what... So I've seen the opposite, actually. I've seen some clients who, who actually become insulin resistant for a short period of time, which is, again... Yeah. Really interesting. Yeah. Like they, they couldn't even respond to a small amount of carbs. Their blood sugar was way all up and dysregulated. So like potentially they've lost the ability wow. to produce those yeah. enzymes. And, and maybe it's even at the level yeah. of GLUT4, right? And so maybe there's something going on with with GLUT4 translocation. But, that, but that's interesting. You know, and, mm -hmm. and again, I think maybe that is related to a genetic variant or, or something that goes on. But some of the people that I've spoken with, you know, they, they take in that carbohydrate and man, it's just, you know, it's stored, it's absorbed, it's, you know, taken up and, you know, weight gain occurs very quickly. I don't know what happened in the case of, of the individuals that you know when they took that in, but um, it's interesting, you know, to hear that they responded by being much more insulin resistant as opposed to, you know, yeah, to adapt. Yeah. So in the case, going back to the protein uh, question, you know, is it a case where if we can, in a healthy model, you know, let's, let's, um, you know, make sure that we're really clear about that. If we're uh, altering that protein and taking a healthy model and we're lowering the protein down, is there some level of hypersensitivity? Is there, you know, um, maybe, you know, glucagon responsiveness or some other uh, factor that's, that's coming into play that is, um, yeah, just, creating a, a much more hypersensitive model. Is the liver, is the liver more um, sensitive to this? Lower amino acid intake that over time, it just begins to uh, fuel the amino acid pool, pool and the delivery of amino acids to a greater degree. And then when the muscles receive it, you know, they just operate at a, at a higher intensity level of, of protein synthesis. I don't know, but it's interesting when you look at that. And again, this was an acute study where they gave these differences in dosing of, of protein that the higher dose just didn't activate protein synthesis as well as that lower dose. And I guess to your question, over time, um, you know, is that further uh, exacerbated or is it kind of mediated? I don't know. Yeah. Hey, ladies and gents, I interrupt this podcast to bring you a special message from Halo Neuro. So I've been playing with this little gizmo 
for the better part of two years. And I've actually been going uh, consistently for the last three weeks, every time before I train. And if you want to have a little chuckle, every time before I play the piano. So I've never been a musical person in my life. So I've been taking some piano lessons. And no, there aren't any videos yet, but maybe there will be. And I've been experimenting with days of using this Halo Sport and days of not using the Halo. And I actually notice a pretty significant ability in my uh, ability to access the keys faster and not have to think about it. It's almost like a flow state that I'm achieving, which is really interesting to me. So I notice a definitive difference when I'm training. There's no question. There's, there's a faster attenuation of skill. There's a faster rate of exciting my nervous system and getting me to the ability to use heavier weights faster. It just feels like my muscles coordinate faster. For anyone that's ever felt that kind of discomfort or that anger, angry feeling of not really being able to get into your workout because your muscles just don't feel it that day, whatever that subjective feeling is for you. The Halo Sport is a really get great way to combat that and overcome it. And it's cheap relative to the results you're getting, right? So this is something that's going to last you for a long time. And I'm seeing tremendous benefit as far as improving the benefits of your workout. So you guys can head to haloneuro.com. So that's H-A-L-O-N-E-U-R-O.com and use the code Muscle Intelligence for $75 off, which is incredible because the, the product already is not that expensive. Um, and they're hooking you guys up because they love our show and you love our show. And uh, we just want to take care of everyone so we can all have better brains, better skills, and better bodies. And I hope you guys enjoy the rest of the podcast. Remember to check out haloneuro.com and use the code muscle intelligence. Enjoy, guys. Dr. Paul, one of the most interesting things that I found in my research of, of your uh, expertise was the discussion around um, exercise and nutrition to enhance brain function. Um, can you talk to me about that? Because obviously, I'm very interested in that. And it's a huge rabbit hole that I'm, I've gone into lately is looking at um, how we can improve motivation, how we can improve uh, function, dopamine, you know, neurotransmitter levels, etc. I'd love to hear what exact area of focus that you're most interested in, or you found the most um, intriguing. It is. It's a fascinating field. So my, my early entry into this, Ben, was um, actually out of a uh, little bit of default. I had a friend who's a neuropsychologist, and she asked me to collaborate with her on some research that she was conducting on uh, mild cognitive impairment, older mm -hmm. individuals. And these um, were uh, older men and women that were independently living uh, in communities. So, uh, you know, those are coming up all the time, right? Right. You know, we have, um, independent living, we have assisted living. And so what we were interested in is, um, if we were to introduce an exercise model, um, and I'm not referring to nutrition at this point, but just an exercise model in these older individuals over an extended period of time, could we begin to observe, uh, some changes or adaptations that might be happening with certain measures of executive function. So uh, she, we, she had, a, obviously, in her research that she had been conducting, a whole battery of, of tests um, that uh, were proxy measures of executive function. And so we did a baseline measure. We introduced the exercise, and it was an aerobic exercise. And you'll see in a minute here the connection that I have to this these other um, areas that I've done more research on with, um, it was a cardiovascular bout of 30 minutes. So we had them aim for 30 minutes, uh, as many days of the week as they could on this recumbent bicycle. But what was unique about it was as they were riding on this recumbent bicycle, and these again were average aged 82 years old for these men and women, um, relatively functional still, they were independent living. Uh, we, we asked them to also, uh, half of them engage in a, uh, 3d, uh, virtual reality uh, video um, experience. And so while they were riding on this recumbent bike, we put up there uh, um, at, at the time, it was a, a dinosaur uh, chase game. So they were actually chasing dinosaurs. And every time they caught a dinosaur, as they were riding and steering, they would get some coins and some points. Uh, so there's a little bit of motivation in there. And what was so cool, what was so unique about this was that in this relatively short intervention of three months, uh, we were able to demonstrate that in the group that was doing uh, the 3D virtual reality avatar driven um, 
extra game, we call it, uh, they, were ap- they were actually able to um, blunt any further change in mild cognitive impairment that occurred over the three months. Whereas the other group that was just riding um, without any interaction, uh, their mild cognitive impairment actually continued to worsen. Now, what was so fascinating about this was that at the same time, we also drew blood and we were measuring uh, certain neurogenic factors, um, hormones that were circulate that circulate in the blood that are also representative of what's going on what, in the brain. What specifically? Yes. Uh, so brain-derived neurotropic factor, BDNF. And so BDNF yep. actually went yep. up at the same time that their executive function was showing slight improvements um, as a marker of their uh, cognition. Whereas in the other group, there was no change in their brain derived neurotropic factor. And they actually got a little bit worse. So what came out of that study was really fascinating is that um, the, the two things have to be in operation together, meaning uh, when we exercise, and when we're exercising at that level of about 60 to 70% of our maximum, that seems to drive the greatest increase in blood brain uh, blood flow. And we know that the blood brain barrier mm-hmm. is very, very tightly regulated as to how much blood it does let in. But it seems to relax a little bit when we're exercising at that 60 to 70 percent, because it's not so uh, intense. It's not so vigorous. That blood flow is not coursing through the entire body at a really high rate. So the brain kind of relaxes a little bit. And, it, you know, I think it, um, just by that, it allows a little bit more blood to get into the brain, um, stimulates a little bit more. And so this increase in brain-derived neurotropic factor went up. Um, we've also since measured uh, vasculin endothelial growth factor, VEGF. Um, mm-hmm. And we haven't seen any changes in that, but at least from a neurogenic standpoint, um, there seems to be something going on, at least in this, the, the levels of this hormone. So what that really prompted me to do is to look at this research a little bit more closely and see what effect it endurance cardiovascular exercise has on on brain health. And of course, there was a 2008 paper that came out of Germany that was the first paper to show that in um, endurance trained athletes, when they engage in a bout of exercise beyond an hour at 60 to 70 percent of their maximum, uh, the opioid receptors become illuminated. Um, And it was at the same time, at about that 60 to 75 minute time period, that feelings of euphoria shot through the roof. And so that was kind of the first evidence we have back in 2008 of what we call the runner's high. Um, so it was not by mistake that um, I, you know, when I was collaborating with her on that study, um, I made sure that we were exercising these older individuals at that level of 60 to 70%. That's the sweet spot of endurance exercise. And then of course, the other exercise routine that I'm a huge um, proponent of is stretching. Um, some people like to call it yoga, but we know that that's a natural booster to one of our, our brain neurotransmitters, uh, gamma aminobutyric acid, GABA. And so there's uh, really compelling evidence that um, in, in some of the research that's been conducted on yoga, uh, that there's an increased uh, release of GABA. Uh, circulating in the in the body um, when a person has just engaged in a yoga routine. So, those two examples, endurance and and yoga, are kind of the classic examples. And GABA, just so the listeners know, GABA is uh, an inhibitory neurotransmitter. It's going to calm you down, make you feel um, less anxiety, maybe a Absolutely. sense of wellness. Does that That's, sound about yeah, exactly yeah. right. Yeah, anytime we can increase those levels of GABA through that inhibition response, yes, you're going to feel more peace, more content. Um, and that's that's good for people that uh, maybe have a heightened sympathetic or you know um, adrenaline uh, and anxiety, as you said. Very interesting. Um, so, like as as I said, I'm very fascinated with this idea of what we can do on a day to day basis to improve brain function. And something that I advocate everyone do is a morning walk. We call it zero hour. Like as soon as you wake up, sixty minutes, get outside with sunshine. So we're incorporating Perfect. this this bilateral movement for sixty minutes and getting the sunshine as well. And it seems to have an incredible effect. Um, do you know the amount of time that you subjected these people to in the study? Like uh, not the thirty minutes, but the duration of the study. Yeah. So, uh, in the one that I conducted yeah. or the other one, uh, or any. Yeah. yeah. So in the one that we, well, in the one that we did, they averaged, um, three sessions a week of 30 minutes. So they were, and again, these were 82 for how many weeks? age of 82. Uh, so it was a 12 week, 12 weeks. 
Yes, over 12 weeks. And now, yeah. was there any type of graduated increase in their perceived motivation over time, or was it something they saw right from the beginning? You know, it's interesting. We only have anecdotal uh, data on that. But, uh, you know, when we went back, I, I referred to it, and that's, I'm glad you asked that, Ben, because uh, I did a, a, a news um, news report. They had asked me, he said, hey, did you observe anything with these people? And I said, you know, for me, uh, it was almost as though they were a, a deep sea treasure chest that was buried with sand. And after, you know, the first week of them doing this, we, we would go back and, and collect the data. Um, and it was amazing that they, that they literally looked as though they were, you know, pushing all the sand off the treasure chest and that treasure chest was opening up and showing what was truly uh, within them. And yeah, I mean, just the conversations that they had. And so, you know, it's anecdotal stuff, but again, it was kind of reflected in their uh, cognition tests that they had, you know, this significant improvement in their executive functioning, um, that it truly was a, a reawakening um, of them. And so, yeah, there was something really uh, real going on. And uh, the ability to, for us to have captured that was, was really unique and special. And so we're continuing on uh, doing some more of that research. And we're looking nutritionally now to other things like nootropics uh, that can help support this, this natural uh, brain enhancement that's taking place with exercise. And so what is it that nutritionally, omega-3 fatty acids, of course, right? EPA and DHA are, are, have been around and have been shown to um, help depressive symptoms and anxiety. And so, you know, is that an, an additive um, uh, supplement that, that uh, would help play a role? Protein, making sure that uh, because the brain is such a um, significant uh, uh, depot of amino acid uptake. Um, I think we kind of miss that sometimes. You know, we always uh, initially and always default when we talk about protein intake, uh, lean skeletal muscle as the primary you know, site. And of course it is, but brain is, is um, on a per volume basis, uh, a greater source of amino acid uptake. Um, but then the nootropics, you know, there's so much uh, work to be done in that area. And that's a really exciting area to explore to see what effect the combination of this um, interactive exercise. So it's not just any exercise, it's exercise that's done at that 60 to 70% of VO2 max. It's exercise that's done simultaneously that you are engaged. It's not as though these people were, you know, reading a book or watching a, a show or performing mind game, uh, you know, mind tasks like Sudoku. They were actually riding and engaging with their avatar on the screen as part of the exercise that they were doing. And that seems to be the real, um, hmm. you know, holy grail to this is that when we can combine and link exercise with a task that we have on a screen in front of us, or as you described, um, moving our body out in nature, there's something very unique about that naturalistic environment that seems to do a similar, have a similar effect on, on brain health. Um, but then also link it with, nutritional support in the form of nootropics and omega-3 fatty acids. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> yeah. It, it sounds like you're just making it fun, right? You're making it fun rather than dreadful. And if you tell people, you know, who haven't exercised before that, Hey, you're going to exercise for an hour a day or even 30 minutes a day. There's immediately a sense of dread that comes over them. I think like, Oh, I have to exercise. And I think, getting, Hey, we're going to make it a game. You can be able to chase after these cool little dinosaurs. And when and you get it, you're going to get a reward and they're getting that reward mechanism going. Yeah. It sounds like that's part of it, right? The gamification. And I think that's a very interesting thing to think about. You know, I'm going like every morning I walk with my kids and I'm thinking like, okay, how can I make this a game to where now we're running after something? Cause you know, we'll, we'll sometimes, you know, race to the stop sign or race to the next telephone pole or whatever, but like, you know, and then adding in that um, that motivation to like, hey, whoever wins the most telephone polls is going to win X, you know, maybe something as simple as that. I'm thinking through how we can turn it into that game and they're getting that constant hit of dopamine uh, bingo. to uh, yeah, maybe precisely. accelerate you the know, And the process. great thing about it, what you even just described is the gamification that allows for scalability, right? And so it's not uh, a gamification that kind of caps it at a, mm -hmm. at a certain level, but allows for the continued additional... Um, uh, scalability of that engagement. So like you said, you know, running from one telephone pole to the next, um, but then to do it maybe, for example, um, uh, sidestepping or karaoke or something where it's not just that they're going at one 
<laughs> you do it backwards, yeah. So you know all those things. Do, I call that scalability, well. and that's what we're looking to do yeah. in this next <laughs> phase of involvement with these people. Yeah. Is chasing after the dinosaurs is cool, um, but now we have built-in naturalistic environments. Um, for example, they can be in space and they can be doing certain things. So you know when you can keep on adding on different levels of of the engagement that they're experiencing, uh, who knows what the limit might be. You know, we just assume that it's an immutable fact of aging, right? That, you know, cognition is going to go down and can we um, prevent right. the decline? So that's where we were at, right? We were just excited that, man, we, we prevented the decline. Oh, for sure. Imagine for if sure. there's a way to, I mean, who knows if it's on the horizon to actually see an, an, uh, an increase in that cognition. That would be massive. Right. So the, they just opened the first ever virtual reality gym. Have you heard of that? I've, I've heard. I haven't seen uh, any of it. In, it's in San Francisco. The guy's name is Paul DeLuca, who used to own bodybuilding.com. He, okay. he started bodybuilding.com, and he opened the first uh, virtual reality gym in San Francisco. I know nothing about it. I have no idea what's there, but it sounds like it, he's a very bright guy. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to guess it's probably something like this, where you're, you're, you know, you're doing VR and, and you know, chasing after something and making cardio fun and making class fun and like – super interesting i mean the it seems like that may be the next frontier of how to get people to because i mean ultimately exercise retention is the, is the hardest thing right getting people to actually stick on a program yeah. so if you can make it fun for them even if it's artificially making it fun i think you know artificially through vr your brain still gets the same response doesn't know the difference and the, i think the the amount of results in theory would be exponentially greater i would too yeah i, I think um you know, we, we're kind of uh, gelling over, and I, I don't want to leave the uh, the nutrition aspect of what we were talking about because I, I I feel so strongly about it. But you know, the exercise yep, is, we'll so, bring it back. is so important, and I'm glad you went down that path, Ben, because you know one of the things that has completed my my prize life uh, protocol that I developed is the protein pacing. Um, that includes these timed mm -hmm. feedings every four hours. First one within an hour of waking in the morning. I call it the muscle, the morning muscle maximizer. And then the last one within two hours of going to sleep at night, and I call that the bedtime belly fat burner because we have some evidence now to show that it actually is very favorable to body um, metabolism and lean muscle mass overnight when you can have that uh, late night feeding. But the exercise component, you know, having in that endurance exercise because it's so critical critical and favorable to enhancing brain blood flow, uh, the stretching because of the GABA response in the mind body that we know with the deep breathing and um, heart rate variability um, seems to be so much more favorable when you can uh, have people, you know, consciously be more aware of, of that breath and, uh, you know, parasympathetic nervous system drive during those the pranayamic breathing. So there's some real value in both of those. But not to leave out the high intensity interval or sprint interval training because that in and of itself is so valuable. And then the final one is the resistance training, which of course you're the expert at. But you know, when, when we provide those four unique, I mean, they're so unique and different and independent in terms of the, um, the, the health benefit and the the performance benefit, I'll even go so far as to say that, you know, we, we just can't leave those out. And I'm always intrigued by people like you who have um, achieved, you know, the elite level of, of uh, success and performance as an athlete. And, you know, so often we, we silo athletes, right? I mean, um, think about this. So, oh, I'm a, I'm a strength and endurance. I'm a strength athlete or I'm a marathon runner. I'm an endurance athlete. But the reality of it is, and I'm interested to hear, you know, maybe from you, but, you know, having worked with some endurance athletes, uh, let's say, for example, in this case, a marathon runner, they're not only running endurance. They are going to the track and doing sprints <laughs> and they're doing fast. They're doing fast sprints, but they're also getting into the gym and lifting weights. And so for us to uh, suggest that there's only a nutritional paradigm to fit that silo of the athlete as a marathon runner or as a bodybuilder or as a hockey player, I'm a tennis player, um, or as a tennis player, I think is a little bit naive because at the top performance of these athletes, they're going into all of those different areas of, of training. They need to do stretching. If they didn't, they'd be injured. If they'd have to go in and do sprints as a marathon runner. So to not um, support them nutritionally in each of those areas, I think is a little bit short-sighted. So that's kind of one of the missions that I'm on is just to let people know that the reality of it is athletes don't live in silos. You know, they're the, at the, the best ones for sure. And I think that's a big problem in 
professional bodybuilding is when you tell a professional bodybuilder, hey, you should need, you need to walk or you need to breathe or you need to do yoga or you need to meditate, they think you're out of your mind because the paradigm is of the 80s and 90s is such that oh, I just need to go in there and lift heavy. I need to be this this stereotypical meathead uh, bodybuilder. And I'm you know ultimately the guy breaking that mold of being like, man, you don't realize all these positive implications of these things like yoga and breathing and meditation until you start doing them and you're like, oh my goodness, life is better. My brain is better. My training is better. My, my recovery is better. Like my emotional well-being, my, my emotional well-being is better. And then you tie that in with all these other aspects of intelligent nutrition, um, you know, timing it and, and choosing the right sources and eliminating the toxins and you know, all those things. And then all of a sudden people don't realize how much easier muscle building actually becomes, how much better your body can actually perform, how much faster you recover, how much better you sleep. But it's just not in the paradigm yet, right? There hasn't been anybody that's been a pioneer in this until I've come along and started having this conversation around intelligent muscle building rather than just mindless muscle building, right? Love it. So it's wow. just, you know, you get it, man. The paradigm over the last 30 to 40 years has just been lift as heavy as possible, eat as much protein, and, you know, ultimately you're going to grow or or not, mm -hmm. you know, and I, re I really believe people have a greater capacity to build muscle than they even think because most people are doing it poorly, right? You're a research guy. When you look at research, you go, oh, you know, the average you can gain in a year is seven to eight pounds. And, and, you know, if you break that down and go, well, who is doing it and how are they doing it? And it's, it's comical. I really believe it's abysmal. And I think you could put on so much more muscle than you thought in the past if you do it correctly. And if you learn proper, first proper skill of exercise and then follow that up with, you know, proper programming and match that with intelligent nutrition and, and, and then all these other parasympathetic inputs and, you know, the capacity to build muscle is so much greater than people believe. So I'm so grateful for you teaching us about this protein because it is a big piece of the puzzle that we don't get yet. Like there's so much uh, misunderstanding and ambiguity and, and butting of heads, right? Like, yeah. hey, man, I only need one bowl of protein. I eat one meal, that's enough for the day because I hit my macros versus, hey, man, I did it five times. And who? And ultimately, everyone's literally fighting over it, right? Which is why I was so excited to have you on the show to talk about, you know, like, what is the actual answer, man? And, and what is the difference if I eat 100 grams of protein at one meal versus 25? at four meals. No, that's great. I, it, you know, just going back to what you were talking about, um, you know, that's groundbreaking, you know, to, to uh, propose an alternative paradigm to what has been so uh, accepted as dogma and, and tradition, like you said, in the old model. You know, I, I had um, one very good friend who was a bodybuilder. I don't know if you know this name, Peter LaRue. Um, he achieved some level of success, but just a terrific guy. And unfortunately, he passed away much, much too early. But um, you know, looking at that model, I, from what I remember when he was training, and I used to go and um, hang out with him and, and train with him once in a while, but he would take a day where he would um, emphasize a little bit more of what he would call cardio. And I remember him, you know, getting on the bike or getting on the Aerodyne and just, you know, pulling that for 45 minutes, he, you know, wouldn't go over that much uh, on too many occasions, but he would at least do that. So, you know, I'm encouraged that at least there were signs that, you know, some bodybuilders were buying into that endurance model even just once a week yeah and i introduced parasympathetic days like you know people take off days and i'm like no you got to take it one step further than that right you have to go like it's not just about sitting on the couch and not exercising that day you know, it's not just about taking your foot off the gas pedal it's about applying the brake so doing all these parasympathetic inputs on that day and as simple as going for a walk or going out in nature or meditating or doing yoga or maybe it's a you know something that that allows you to kind of recharge your batteries if it's connecting with loved ones or whatever it is that's actually giving you that parasympathetic stimulus uh, has you know honestly exponentially increased the results of a lot of my clients and and the most important thing that i see and again people may underrate this or undervalue this is is the perceived quality of life goes up right so when someone goes into a contest i'm sure you've been around many athletes as they get into shows or, or toward their competition season whatever the sport may be typically the quality of life goes down, right? Their, their perception, yeah, it doesn't need to be that way, right? Like, why is it like that, right? Well, obviously, maybe our brain is lacking some some neurotransmitters. Maybe we're, we're depleted in serotonin or dopamine, or maybe we're lacking GABA. Uh, we don't have the amino acids to support it. Our brain is tired. Our mitochondria may be inefficient or, you know, who knows, X number of things, right? Too much sympathetic input, not enough parasympathetic. But if you support those things in an intelligent way with sleep and HRV, Right. Massive difference, right? Now our perceived um, our perceived effort is down and our quality of life stays high. Gosh, you know, it, it's it's interesting the way the world works. So I was having this conversation with uh, two of the fellows at the chiropractic college yesterday, and one of them uh, was an Olympic uh, 
uh, power lifter and his uh, brother was a, um, he was a power lifter and his brother was an Olympic lifter, but it was just interesting because he was commenting on that. He said, you know, so much have changed since the days when he, they were doing it competitively and that it wasn't sure. um, back in those days, as you just described, it was so focused on the performance outcome, not the health. Right. So how many years ago was that? Uh, so it probably would have been 15, 20 years ago for him. Right. So look at how much the world has changed in 20 years, right? Like everything is different. You know, it's all about the internet. It's all about your phone. You have so much more sympathetic input oh. now, I believe, than even 20 years ago, right? Now, 40 years ago would be exponentially less sympathetic input, mm -hmm. right? You look at a guy like Arnold Schwarzenegger, what was his life? He didn't have a cell phone. He went to the gym. He went to the beach. He rode his bicycle. He went for a walk. He, you know, like it was a completely different environment, less EMF in the environment, less pollution in the water, less pollution in the air. Your body's under less toxic load. So you have to have the strategies in place to combat these things. Otherwise you can't be like that. So people are saying, Hey, the bodybuilders are getting worse now. I'm like, well, it's because they're not introducing these things, right? They're not introducing the things to balance out the toxic burden, to balance out the sympathetic drive that exists in our, in as a default in our community. So here's, here's a great stat for you that I've learned from one of my podcast guests in 1920, it was suggested, the military suggested that the resonant breath rate, the number of breaths per minute was seven. So, Average average person, seven breaths per minute. Now, 19. Gives you an idea of what's happening to the sympathetic nervous system, right? You're, sympathetic, you're on sympathetic overdrive all the time. That's at rest. 19 breaths per minute is average compared to seven just 100 years ago, right? What does that say about what's happening inside your body? That's huge. You know, I teach physiology, as you know. So we talk about that. And in, and in textbooks, the um, average number of respirations now, they even report in textbooks is 12 to 15 is what, you know, is normal. I shouldn't say average. Sure. It's what's normal. We want you to be at right. 12 to 15. Right. Listening to that statistic really resonates and hits home. You know, that 1920, it was around seven. And when you do pranayamic breathing, when you do deep breathing, as you we talked about diaphragmatic, you know, that's, that's kind of where you're at. And I noticed that, you know, if I'm in a relaxed, content state, I'm down at seven, eight, you know, respirations per minute. Uh, but like you said, it takes effort and it takes work in our current society, because as you said, man, we are constantly bombarded. Um, you know, it's, it's just fascinating uh, listening to this and, and your comment, you've brought it up a couple of times, Ben, is uh, the toxin release. So I don't know if you have this um, in front of you, but of course I've measured toxins and they're very, very costly. And one of the um, top uh uh, laboratories that measures them is out in Vancouver. So I've, I've spent, I've sent my, my samples out to Vancouver and they've measured these toxins, but it's a fascinating- Just air quality? What's that? Just in the air? No. So I, I measure in the blood. So I've, okay. I've, I've measured up to, um, in any one given study, uh, in the last study I did, I measured uh, 11 different PCB congeners. Now, this is an interesting topic because it relates exactly to what you're talking about. You know, when we look at PCBs, of course, they were banned back in 1970s, right? 1979 was the last time we had PCBs that were, you know, permissible or allowed. Mm -hmm. We're still finding high levels of PCBs in people. So what does that tell you? Well, one, for sure, they're still in the food supply. They're, you know, getting taken up into soil and the water. Uh, they're being passed down, unfortunately, um, through the placenta into the, you know, the fetus. And I'm sure that, you know, young babies, obviously. Are, so, but adults that have any significant degree of, of, a, of abdominal, visceral fat accumulation are having an increased uh, accumulation of PCB congeners because that's where they like to be stored. They're very lipophilic, right? And toxins love fat. And unfortunately- Where do they, PCBs come from? Sorry to interrupt you, where do they come from? Well, the, you know, it's, it's uh, it just, just chemicals, chemicals that have been, yeah, chemicals that have been- uh, uh, What were the chemicals used for? Uh, I'm not familiar yeah, many, with it. Like I've heard the term, but I don't- Yeah, PCBs, many of them in an industrial, um, in industrial manufacturing, um, mm -hmm. uh, I have a list of, of some of the specific, um, uses of the PCBs, but mostly in industrial. So water supply and soil is, is a lot of where they have since been kind of, you know, sucked away or, or uh, deposited. And that's why I think we're seeing still so much of them, uh, occurring in human specimens. And in this case in blood, um, but yeah, they were, they were banned, uh, back in, the seventies and we're still seeing evidence of them in people. I, the, the amounts that I measured in some of the, my, uh, study participants was alarming. 
<laughs> you know, some of them had that high of levels. Um, it's just, yeah, it's alarming. Yeah, and it's 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 discouraging sometimes to think you almost are a puppet, right? Like you, as much as I attempt to pay attention to my environment and control the things that go into my body food-wise and water-wise, it's it's little like, you know, you could drive yourself crazy trying to stress about all the different things, right? Cuz you talk about glyphosate in the air and in the water. You talk about deuterium in the air and in the in the water. And you talk about PCBs, I mean, 8 million different astrazine, 8 different million estrogenic compounds. Mm-hmm. Uh and that's just one like category, you know, it, it's insane to think um, what we subject our body to. And, and at the same time, I'm extremely grateful for what our body is capable of doing and staying alive in these environments, you know, and, but there's gotta be someone, um, you know, paying close attention to how to begin to improve the excretion process and, you know, offering a, a little bit of what I do is like, you know, first phase of, of a transformation with someone who comes into my world is literally, as I say, uh, we walk every morning, we breathe, and we decrease the toxic burden, and we try to increase the body's ability to excrete. So it's increasing urination, uh, increasing fiber, so increasing excretion that way, and then sweating. So like literally, yeah. how could we get how could we get toxins out of the body as quickly as possible? Because I noticed such a massive decrease in body fat and improvement in body composition just by doing that. You know, that yeah. that's what I call like ground level transformation stuff. If you're not willing to walk every single day, if you're not willing to improve or uh, implement a breathing practice and decrease your toxic burden everything else after that is way less effective way less um influential on your body composition couldn't agree more <laughs> i think walking is is so underrated you know I, th- I think it's it's just not given enough credit um for what it can do particularly as we've talked about out in nature you know where you have an opportunity to right as a, at that 60 yeah, percent effort yeah the lower the, you know relatively lower effort out in nature breathing as you're doing it huge yeah uh fantastic good stuff Thanks, Dr. Paul. I'm, I'm truly grateful for your time and your wisdom. Where can our listeners find out more from you? Well, a couple of places. Uh, ben, thank you, first of all, for having me. You know, this has been such an enlightening conversation for me. I'm so impressed with what you're doing on a, on a regular basis. You know, I've had an opportunity to listen to some of your podcasts and thank you. have learned a great deal. So keep up the work that you're doing. Thank you. um, but Prize Life uh, on Facebook yeah. and on the uh, internet. And then... Um, Prize, we should note, is, is spelt with an S, with an S, so it's P R I S E L I F E. Prize with an S. That's right. And then, of course, my new book has just come out, and a lot of what we've talked about today um, is in the book. In fact, I go into detail about uh, the um, the sources of PCBs, the our exposure to them, uh, the importance of, of an intermittent fast occasionally. Um, I talk about, obviously, in great depth, the, the protein pacing uh, mm-hmm. component, but I also uh, discuss in great detail the prize that you and I have kind of uh, evolved into in this conversation, and that is the resistance interval stretching and endurance, and all the side effects, obviously beneficial side effects uh, that that has on our health as well as our performance. So grateful. Very, very cool. And I will definitely link to that in the show notes. Dr. Paul, thank you very much for your time. And I look forward to hearing more from you in the future. Hey, thanks, Ben. Really appreciate it. Keep up your great work. Thank you very much. All right, ladies and gents, here's a wrap up from Raspy Ben. This might be the last time you ever hear this voice. So I thought I'd give you guys the pleasure of enduring a little bit more of my smoker's voice. Um, but I hope you enjoyed the podcast with Dr. Asiero. Not too much depth of information, but certainly beneficial information. It wasn't, you know, the scientific deep dive that you guys are maybe used to, but always great for a little refresher course on the necessity of the basics of movement and cardiovascular activity and protein pacing. Now, if you didn't hear my conversation about the Halo Sport that I've been using for the last couple of years, I originally started with the Halo 1 and now I'm using the Halo 2. Um, the updated version is allowing for better connection to your, uh, to your head. So this is an electrical stimulation device sending electrical signals directly into your primary motor cortex of your brain. That's the part of your brain responsible for motor learning, accelerating the the rate of learning. So this could be accelerated learning, something that's um, a mental skill. So it could be accelerating um, retention of information, or it could be accelerating the rate of skill acquisition in the gym or for really anything. And as I said, I'm, I'm using it secretly in my piano lessons lately. And uh, I'm not planning on doing this forever, but I thought it would be a really cool experiment for me to 
test out how I can learn the piano. And to be honest, I really enjoy it. It's actually nice when you pick up a skill and it doesn't feel like you're a bull in a china shop. And my hands seem to actually work at a pretty quick pace. Maybe it's all the typing I do on a computer, or maybe it's the Halo Sport, probably a combination of the both. Uh, but I'm really enjoying it. And no, I am not Mozart. I will not play for you guys yet, but maybe one day I'll bust out and uh, play you guys a tune. So uh, if you want to head over to haloneuro.com, you guys are going to get hooked up with $75 off H A L O. N-E-U-R-O.com, $75 off when you use the code Muscle Intelligence. And go ahead and leave us a review on how much you love my raspy voice and how much you really want to hear me play the piano. And if you guys do and I get enough amazing reviews from you, maybe I'll make it happen one episode. Have a great day, guys. Live your greatest life in a body you love. Thank you so much for tuning in to Muscle Intelligence. If you enjoyed today's episode, please be sure to share it with at least one person you know. Make sure you're subscribed so you never miss an episode. This podcast is for information purposes only. The statements and views on this podcast are not medical advice. This podcast, including Ben Bikulski and the producers, disclaim responsibility for any possible adverse effects from the use of information contained herein. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. This podcast does not make any representations or warranties about guest qualifications or credibility. This podcast may contain paid endorsements or advertisements for products or services. Individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest and products or services referred to herein. If you think you have a medical problem, consult a licensed physician.